is. Okay, great. Well, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Sarah Schneiderman, and I'm a faculty member here at UBC in anthropology, as well as the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, I am a member of the Center for India and South Asia Research Executive Committee, and I, am, I will be moderating today's event in that capacity. Uh, also formerly was a co-director of CSAR, as we call it, along with uh, Anne Murphy, who's worked to coordinate uh, this event today. Um, I am also currently teaching a course in the ethnography of South Asia, and so was excited to have this event to share with students, and I hope some of you are here today as well. Um, today is the first of two talks in the Engaging Today series. Uh, the title of today's uh, event is Your Dream is Our Dream from H.G. Mudgal to South Asians for Black Lives. The next talk will be on August 18th, titled South Asians for Black Lives, Cast and Anti-Blackness. And if you haven't already registered for that one, please do go ahead uh, so you can participate in uh, both parts of the conversation. Before going further, I want to acknowledge that our program today is based at UBC, uh, which is situated on the unceded ancestral territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. Um, and I realize it's a kind of strange situation that many of us are, of course, not right here. We're spread perhaps all over Canada, all over uh, North America, all over the world. And yet, wherever you are, um, I would like to ask everybody who's participating to think about the land on which you sit, uh, where you're participating from, and its histories and entanglements um, with Indigenous and other uh, bodies and labor and care over time. Uh, and through those forms of care, uh, it's through those forms of care that, of course, we're able to be here. Uh, all together today. And I hope that these events give us an opportunity um, to talk about South Asian lives, Black lives, and also Indigenous lives, and all of our entanglements with each other over time. Thanks. Um, I also want to um, take a moment to recognize the passing of someone who was um, very dear to many people, many members of this community, um, Dr. Chinmoy Banerjee, a faculty member at Simon Fraser University and the founder of the Dr. Hadi Sharma Foundation, as well as SANSA, the South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy, among uh, an active member of many other organizations. Of course, many of you here uh, will have known Chin and heard the very sad news of his passing uh, just about a week ago. Um, so it was our hope that we could uh, dedicate the conversations here today in his memory. I would also like to thank the supporters of this series of events. Uh, the primary sponsor is the Interdisciplinary Histories Research Cluster at UBC, along with the Center for, Indig uh, for India and South Asia Research. Supporting partners as well are the South Asian American uh, Digital Archives, um, South Asian Canadian Digital Archives at University of the Fraser Valley, Equality Labs, the Poetic Justice uh, Foundation, and also the Institute of Asian Research and School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at UBC, uh, which are the home institutions within which CSAR is based. Um, finally, I want to thank Umayo Nagasaran, who you see here, uh, who has, is the program assistant for CSAR and has done the hard work of getting this virtual environment set up for us here today. Thank you very much for making this possible. Before introducing our speakers, I just want to say a word about how the format of today's event is going to work. Uh, we're here in a Zoom webinar uh, so that um, you can listen to the presenters and you can type any questions that you may have in the Q&A window. You're welcome to ask questions at any point during the conversation. Uh, we'll collect the questions and I will be posing them to the speakers as the moderator um, at the end. Uh, so um, please do go ahead and share your thoughts in that way. Um, we won't be having um, verbal questions, right? We won't be having microphones on, um, just the presenters will be able to speak. Uh, thank you for understanding those constraints. Uh, the, it's now 10 past four and we need to end at 5.30 uh, p.m. Sorry, that's in Pacific time. So we have just about an hour and a half for our discussion. So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce the speakers and um, then we can get into the conversation. 
So first we have Samit, Samit Malik, uh, who is the co-founder and executive director of SADA, the South Asian American Digital Archive. For the last 12 years, SADA has enabled academics, artists, journalists, students, and community members to write books, create new content, and shape public understanding about the South Asian American community. Through its archival collections and digital storytelling initiatives, SADA works to reimagine the potential of community archives in the digital era. Uh, Summit's work at the intersection of technology and storytelling builds on his backgrounds in history, computer science, and library and information sciences. And he's joining us today from Philadelphia. Welcome, Summit. After Summit speaks, and he'll be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, we'll have Dr. Sutherlander Karabayans uh, to speak with us as a commentator on Summit's presentation. Um, and she is director of the South Asian Studies Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley and an associate professor in sociocultural media studies uh, within the College of Arts at University of the Fraser Valley. Her critical analysis of India's multilingual policy and planning has fueled her interest to study the impact of language, culture, and identity on South Asian Canadian migration, settlement, and integration. Her research includes and intersects cross-cultural education with a focus on anti-racist curriculum implementation, race, race, racism, and ethnicity, identity politics, Sikh feminist ideology, migration in the South Asian Canadian diaspora, and Punjabi Canadian cultural historiography. The South Asian Canadian Digital Archive, about which she will speak, is developing a rich comprehensive archive for public and academic use. And the archive's goal is to bring existing archives and new collections into one place to assist with creating a comprehensive online repository of South Asian Canadian history and the experiences of diverse peoples. So I think we're really privileged to have the opportunity here today to think about uh, the histories and the trajectories that have brought us all here together uh, and to think about archives and archival work as a way of understanding um, the rich uh, and diverse uh, experiences of those who came before us and uh, hopefully think about where we may all go together next. Um, so thank you very much for being here with us and I'll turn it over now uh, to Summit. I think he's sharing his slides and uh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so Thanks. much, uh, Professor Schneiderman. Um, yeah, this is uh, really wonderful to, to have this opportunity to speak with all of you. I um, wish I could see all of your faces. I wish more than anything that we could all be together in person, but I am able to see the list of attendees and it's wonderful to see so many familiar names, so many friends, so many supporters of SADA. So thank you all, all of you for making some time out of your evening to be here with us for this conversation. Uh, I also wanted to join Professor Schneiderman in thanking a few people who made tonight's event possible. First, of course, Professor Schneiderman herself um, for moderating the conversation. I also wanted to thank Umail for doing all the behind the scenes work to make today's event possible. And I also wanted to thank Professor Ann Murphy, who, as Professor Schneiderman mentioned, is the person who kind of instigated and initiated this conversation in the series that this conversation is part of. Um, Professor Murphy wasn't able to be part of the panel this evening, but she asked me to share a little bit about the Punjabi project that they have at UBC um, and which you can learn more about at punjabi.arts.ubc.ca slash research. And I wanted to read um, just briefly what she says about this project. She says, our project right now focuses on documenting the history of Punjabi in British Columbia, interviewing the people who have advocated for Punjabi, taught Punjabi, built institutions to support it, and who participate in the vibrant Punjabi language writing community. So please check out the work that they're doing. As Professor Schneiderman mentioned, this is also um, a, the first in a, in a two-part series of conversations that are being hosted by UBC, uh, the second of which will be on August 18th and feature Equality Labs and the Poetic Justice Foundation and the topic being cast in anti-Blackness. And I think that conversation is really crucial um, in picking up from where this conversation will leave off today. So please do join that second conversation if you're able to. The last thing that I'll mention is that I'll be sharing stories from the archive today, be reading some texts, um, from other sources. And so um, rather than have you try to jot down notes about where these sources are, I created a, a page on the SADA website that you can visit, sada.org slash UBC, S-A-A-D-A dot O-R-G slash UBC, where there are links to each of the references that I'll provide in the, in the, in the comments that I make. And so um, it's a much easier way to find what I'm talking about. So for many of you are likely familiar with SADA's work, but for those who aren't, let me give you some background first, if I may. Um, SADA is the South Asian American Digital Archive, an organization that I helped to found in 2008, so 12 years ago, 
really recognizing that stories from the South Asian American community weren't simply weren't being systematically collected or preserved by other institutions, archives, museums, and others. And fearing that not only were our community's stories not being heard, but moreover that they were in danger of being lost entirely. There's a quote from a scholar of archival studies named Jeanette Bastien that I often share when I introduce Sada's work, and I'd like to share that quote again today. But I want to give it a slightly different context today, because what Jeanette Bastien's research looks at is what impact it has for communities to not have access to their own histories. And um, when I usually when I share this quote, I'm usually thinking about the South Asian American community in isolation. But of course, none of our communities are in isolation from each other. And so as I share this quote today, I want to think especially not only about the South Asian American community in our history, but also the histories of connections between pe people of color and communities of color in the United States. Here's what Jeanette Bastian says about the impact it has for communities to not have access to their own histories. She says, a community without its records is a community under siege, defending itself, its identity, and its version of history without a firm foundation on which to stand. There are a few things that I hope I'll be able to share in my presentation today. So the first is to be able to include South Asian Americans in the racial history of the United States. Often when people think about American history, they see it in very black and white terms. And, but South Asians and other minority communities and other people of color have been part of the American story from the very beginning. And so I'd like to talk more about that history and how it interplays with the racial identity and histories of the United States. The second is to share stories of the long lineage of South Asian solidarity with the struggle against anti-Black racism. I think the movements that we're seeing today, the mass protests that we're seeing in the United States today, certainly have a long lineage of their own, but South Asian involvement in those mass protests also has its own history. And I wanna share a little bit of that history with you today. And the third thing that I wanna do is for us to recognize that for us to move forward in any meaningful way, that we must not only be in solidarity with black communities, but that we must address anti-blackness and casteism within our own community, within the South Asian American community. So I'd like to share some stories from the archive that demonstrate that as well. Following the murder of George Floyd earlier this summer and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others, South Asians began participating or continued participating in the movements for Black Lives. There are a couple incidents from the summer that I want to highlight. One is the response by the owners of the Gandhi Mahal restaurant in Minneapolis, which was burned during the protests following the murder of George Floyd. I'm gonna read a, a quick excerpt from the social media post where they wrote very powerfully about their involvement. They said, don't worry about us. We'll be rebuilt and we will recover. This is Hafsa, Ruhel's daughter writing, as I'm sitting next to my dad watching the news. I hear him say on the phone, let my building burn. Justice needs to be served. Put those officers in jail. Gandhi Mahal may have felt the flames last night, but our fiery drive to help protect and stand with our community will never die. Peace be with everyone. Justice for George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. And the story of Rahul Dube, a South Asian American community member in Washington, DC, who opened his home during the protests following the murder of George Floyd, two protesters who were being harassed, threatened, and tear gassed and attacked by the police in Washington, DC. But these incidents are part, as I mentioned, of a long lineage of South Asian solidarity with the struggle against anti-Black racism. And so we shouldn't be surprised by them, but it's some of us, I think many of us are. And the reason I think that we're surprised often by seeing South Asian involvement in the movement for Black lives is because we are, are not aware of the historical precedent for it. Precedent for it. And to talk about why I think that history is so important, I wanna share a little bit of the research that Sada's co-founder, Michelle Caswell, has been doing. Michelle is the professor of archival studies at UCLA, and her research, along with that of her students, focuses on the idea of symbolic annihilation. Symbolic annihilation, in the terms that I can explain it at least, uh, is what happens when you don't see yourself or your community reflected in history or in popular media. The damaging impact that that can have, the way it limits our understandings of ourselves and our communities and our possibilities in life. The flip side of, this, of that is an idea that Michelle and her students have developed called representational belonging. What, what begins to happen when you begin to see your community reflected for the very first time? And as I was saying, not just our own community in isolation, but the solidarities and linkages between our community and other communities of color. It's very powerful for this to happen. I wanna share an anecdote from um, a walking tour of Philadelphia that, South, that Sada has developed called Revolution Remix. It's a walking tour for those who are familiar with Philadelphia that starts at the Liberty Bell. And some of you who on this, um, at this meeting have perhaps been on the tour as well. But it starts at the Liberty Bell, kind of winds its way around Old City in Philadelphia and ends at um, Ray Street Pier on the banks of the Delaware River. 
It's a tour that takes you through what most would consider the most historic parts of the American Republic, but that share stories of South Asian Americans in those spaces from the 1780s up to the present day. And so hopefully it powerfully changes the way that people imagine Philadelphia and its history, including South Asian Americans in that story. But the very first time that we did this, this is a photograph, sorry, of, this, of the walking tour, um, and Imran um, Siddiqui who leads the tour and some of our um, participants in, in our first walking tour. The very first time that we did this walking tour, I remember this very distinctly, we're standing at the corner of Sixth and Arch, which is where we share the story of Anandi Bai Joshi. She was the first South Asian woman to earn a medical degree anywhere in the world. She did that here in Philadelphia in 1886. She came here in 1883. And she came to Philadelphia because it was one of the very, one of the only places in the world where a woman at that time could right. earn a degree in Western medicine. And so while we're standing at, at this corner, um, this is actually the group, this is a photograph from later in the tour. So this is a group, as you can see, um, of all South Asian community members. As we're standing at this corner, um, a car passes by, stops at the intersection. There's two white men in the car. They roll down their window and they, and they yell a pro-Trump slogan at us. And at the moment I was completely taken aback. I laughed it off. For those of us in the US even who live in big cities, often you imagine that you're in a bubble, that the Trump support that you see in rural and suburban areas won't affect you. But so I was completely taken aback as I think most of the participants in the tour was, as uh, most of the participants on the tour were. But the more I think about it, the more I realize how threatening it is for people who are invested in white supremacy to see South Asians and other people of color, seeing our histories, learning our histories, advocating for histories and um, connecting our histories with each other. And so that's why I think it's so powerful for us to be doing this work now. Like I said, our history is full of these examples of South Asians recognizing that our liberation is inextricably linked with the struggle against anti-Black racism. And I wanna start by sharing a story uh, of, of that from Professor Nico Slate's book, Colored Cosmopolitanism. And I'm actually gonna read um, an excerpt from the book in his words because I think he writes very powerfully about the story. This is what he says. In the spring of 1941, in the midst of the Second World War, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay sat down in the whites only section of a segregated train traveling through the American South, just across the Louisiana border. The ticket collector ordered her to move. She asked him why. That is the rule, he replied, and you better obey it or you will regret it. She did not move. He walked away angrily, but soon returned, subdued, it seemed, by something he had learned. He asked where she was from, making clear that he realized she was not African-American. New York, she said evasively. I mean, which land do you hail from, he clarified. By the way, for those of us who are South Asian American, how many times have you heard this question, where are you from, no, where are you really from? Amazing to hear that it was happening in 1941 as well. At this point, she could have proudly explained that she was a distinguished visitor from India, a colleague of Mahatma Gandhi, and a champion of Indian independence and the rights of Indian women, and that she had only a few months before had tea with Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Instead, when prompted, she had, uh, instead when prompted to tell the man from which land she came, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay replied, it makes no difference. I am a colored woman, obviously, and it's unnecessary for you to disturb me for I have no intention of moving from here. The ticket collector muttered, you're an Asian, but he did not bother her again. By refusing to move, Kamala Devi defied the legalized bigotry of the American South. By proclaiming herself colored, she expressed solidarity with the millions of African Americans for whom the brutalities of segregation were a part of daily life. This was more than a fleeting gesture. Kamala Devi understood the efforts of African Americans as crucial to a global struggle against racism and imperialism, a struggle she framed in terms of color. Her self-definition as a colored woman epitomized a colored cosmopolitanism that transcended traditional racial distinctions, positioning Indians and African Americans together at the vanguard of the darker races. Articulated most eloquently by W.E.B. Du Bois, colored cosmopolitanism appealed to those working to forge a united front against racism, imperialism, and other forms of oppression. Advocates of colored cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism fought for the freedom of the colored world, even while calling into question the meanings of both color and freedom. So that is just one of the stories that I mentioned of these solidarities between South Asians and black communities. But before I share more, I wanna take a step back and share a little bit about South Asian American history to give you some context in which these stories are appearing. So South Asians began arriving in the United States in large numbers beginning in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And those who were coming here at that time were coming primarily from the Punjab region of British India, coming primarily to settle on the West Coast in California, Oregon, Washington State, as well as, of course, in British Columbia. 
they were coming primarily as well to work as laborers. So they're working on farms, fields, lumber yards, mills, et cetera. There were smaller numbers, much smaller numbers of people who were able to come for other reasons. This, for example, is a photograph from 1914 of members of the Illinois chapter of the Hindustan Association of America. This was an organization that much like South Asian Students Associations of today, that helped to acclimate and coordinate students um, at college campuses around the country who are here from South Asia. There were remarkably few South Asian women allowed into the country in the early 1900s due to very restrictive immigration policy. This is an article from 1915, as you see, titled Nose Diamond, Latest Fad Arrives Here from India, describing the arrival of one of the very few South Asian women allowed into the country, Kala Bagai, in San Francisco. She arrived here with her husband and their three young sons. The reality that these early immigrants faced was one of incredible xenophobia, bigotry, and racism. This is an article from 1906, as you can see, titled Our First Invasion by Hindus and Mohammedans, and another from 1907 titled Have We a Dusky Peril, Hindu Hordes Invading the State. I should note that the term Hindu is being here, used here as a racial classification, not as a religious classification. So it was pri primarily Punjabi Sikh men who were here from South Asia, but they were termed racially as Hindu in the United States. And that's a term that you'll see crop up again and again throughout my presentation. Just a few months after this article in Bellingham, Washington, there was a race riot where the Punjabi men who had settled in this town were violently chased out of the town by a group of white men. And this touched off other anti-immigrant sentiment violence in, um, in California as well as in British Columbia. This anti-immigrant sentiment and xenophobia was reflected in Congress, uh, in legislative policy, and in judicial decisions. In 1917, U.S. Congress passed the 1917 Immigration Act, which drew a line around South Asia and parts of Southeast Asia and barred immigration from that part of the world to the United States. And that's, it's actually striking to realize the parallels between what was happening in 1917 and what's happening in the United States today. In fact, it was almost 100 years to the day after the 1917 Immigration Act was signed by Congress barring South Asian immigration that President Trump signed the first Muslim ban executive order in 2017. So once again, these histories have quite a bit of relevance to our conversations today. And all of this culminated in the South Asian context in 1923 with a US Supreme Court decision, United States v. Bhagat Singh Thind, where the Supreme Court decided unanimously on racial grounds that South Asians should be barred from becoming American citizens. This is a magazine article from that time describing the Supreme Court decision. And as you can see, that's titled Hindus True Brunette to Vote Here. And there's a photograph of a South Asian man with a caption that simply reads, quote unquote, the problem. So that gives you a sense of the ethos in this country at that time. And the Supreme Court decision was compounded by other legislative policy and um, acts that were passed to either implicitly or explicitly prevent South Asians and other Asians from immigrating to the United States. And that policy was in place until 1946, so more than 20 years, until finally after years and years of campaigning by the South Asian community, um, South Asians in the United States were allowed to become American citizens. And Congress raised the quota to allow up to 100 new South Asian immigrants per year from the entire Indian subcontinent, all of South Asia. It was really only in 1965, so uh, with the passage of the Immigration Nationality Act of 1965, that South Asians and others from other parts of Asia, Latin America, Africa, and other parts of the world were allowed to come into the United States in larger numbers. That certainly includes my family, perhaps you or your own families. I mean, it's important to note that it was only in the midst of the civil, right move, civil rights movement led by Black Americans that this 1965 Immigration Nationality Act became possible. But it's important to note as well that the lives that our community has created for ourselves is only possible because of the struggles against anti-Black racism, such as was happening during the civil rights movement. But rather than seeing this as a history of indebtedness, I would like to suggest that we see this as a history of interconnectedness, that our past and our future liberation is inextricably linked to that of Black communities. One of the stories that's told about our community and often that we tell, tell ourselves is that due to our wealth or educational attainment that we are exempt from the racial dynamics of the United States. But I'd like to share a story with you from um, the archive that I think helps understand the complexities therein. This is also a story um, from the Revolution Remix walking tour. And I'd like to credit Imran Siddiqui, who, as I mentioned, is the tour guide for the walking tour and how also helped to develop many of the narratives on the tour, including this one. So perhaps you've heard of Bose speakers or Bose headphones. It's a very well-known brand across uh, the world now. But um, fewer people I would, would know, I would suggest that Bose was a company started by a South Asian American. 
The founder of Bose was a Philadelphia native named Amar Gopal Bose, born in the city on November 2nd, 1929, to an Indian man and a white American woman. And Bose's accounts of growing up in Philadelphia in the 1930s and 1940s before becoming a successful business person paint a picture of the racial tensions which were part of daily life back then and in so many ways continue to be today. Amar Gopal, Gopal Bose's father, Noni Gopal Bose, let's call him Bose Sr. for the shake, sake of easiness, was a Bengali freedom fighter who had been involved with revolutionary groups in India while he was still a student at, the, at Calcutta University. He was fighting for India's independence, but when he realized British officials were after him, he escaped to the United States with about, without a passport and with just $5 in his pockets. Bose Sr. ran an import business in Philadelphia after he arrived. And the home address on a letter written by him is a building on 7th Street, for those who know Philadelphia, just south of Market Street, less than a block away from where Thomas Jefferson and Bob Hemings, an enslaved black man, resided in 1776, while Jefferson wrote the Jeff Declaration of Independence. In addition to his import business, Bo Senior also became involved in the Gadar Party, working alongside Tarak Nath Das and others for India's independence from British rule. Bo Senior's job was to mobilize moral and material support for India's struggle for independence. He ended up marrying a white school teacher named Charlotte and settled down in Philadelphia. And Bose Jr., the founder of Bose Audio, recounts that often there would be hush-hush meetings of Gather Party activists in their home in Philadelphia. But the idealism and the urgency which the Bose family held was soured by the realities of racism in the city. After the great migration of the 1920s, when millions of Black Americans moved out of the South and headed north for jobs, the population of Philadelphia was dramatically changed and many white residents were not happy about that change. Hypersegregation was already a reality at the time of the Great Depression in 1929, but that event only heightened class tensions across racial lines. This was the context in which Bose and his family moved to Philadelphia in the 1930s. As a child, Bose remembers his father telling him stories of struggling to find someone willing to rent them a house in the city. He recalls how they used to enter a restaurant and how they would be kept waiting without service because of their skin color. On one of these nights, as the family waited patiently to be served, only to be ignored repeatedly by the waiting staff, both senior began to grow agitated. We can imagine the scene for a moment. In a restaurant filled with white patrons, here sat this person who had arrived in the United States with great hope, and even begun to build a family and a life here because of that hope. Yet after years of being stifled by instances of racism like this, he was disheartened and frustrated. The Supreme Court had recently denaturalized all South Asian Amer American men and their spouses in the United States v. Bhagat Singh Thin decision. His home country was still under British rule, and here he was, just trying to have a meal with his family, still under the rule of white men. So perhaps he was a bit angry too. Whatever he was feeling, this evening he had had enough. After the restaurant continued to refuse to serve him, he asked to speak directly to the restaurant owner, standing up for himself and his family. Sir, he said, we are good enough to cook and wait and serve you. We are good enough to die for this country in the wars, but we're not good enough to pay and be served. Why is that? And then Bose Senior led his family out of the restaurant. Amar Gopal Bose's childhood, in comparison to his later fame and fortune, reminds us that there's no one story about our communities. In fact, there isn't even a single story to tell about a single South Asian family. And yet so often there's only a single story told about us, one which limps us all together in a single easily dismissed idea. It is easier, more comfortable for some to think of our community, to think of South Asian Americans as a monolith. But this hides uncomfortable truths about our past and our present. For example, there are currently over a half million undocumented South Asians living in the United States today. And one in 10 of all South Asian Americans are living in poverty. But looking deeper at stories like Bose's from the past helps us to face more of these truths today and builds greater understanding for various South Asian American communities and uh, especially those who are most vulnerable in this present moment. The next story that I wanna share with you from the archive is the story of H.G. Mudgal, who's mentioned in the title of today's talk. And it's a story that I hope will, hope will demonstrate two things. One is of course, the continued solidarity of, between South Asians and black communities in the struggle for, uh, against anti-black racism. The other, as I mentioned earlier, is the ways that our community has had to reckon with anti-blackness and casteism within our own community and H.G. Midgill's story from 100 or so years ago, I think has a lot of resonance with the ways that our community is thinking about race today. I also wanna give credit to Manan Desai and Thizarat Gill, who wrote about H.G. Mudgal for Ties, which is Sada's online magazine, and to Krithika Agarwal, who wrote about John Muhammad Ali, who you'll hear about in just a minute in the story as well. 
1930, a South Asian immigrant published a vicious letter in the Chicago Defender, penned under the name K. Romola. And what he did in this letter was dismiss any possible solidarity between African Americans and South Asians. Here's what he wrote. Too much has been written by the Negro papers, magazines, and fourth-rate writers like Du Bois about the darker races, he wrote. But who in the hell wants to join the caravan with the black ones? Our caste system in India excludes those who do not belong to the Aryan white race. And we even here exclude any Indians who live and socialize with the Negro. H.G. Mudgal, a South Asian immigrant living in Harlem, wrote a scathing and ferocious response, describing his fellow Indian as, quote, out of touch and self-hating, a victim of white propagandists. Romola had, in H.G. Mudgal's words, utterly forgotten the political, social, and economical oppression that India has been subjected to under the British. Mudgal's life and political work was deeply invested in Black causes. Born in the city of Hubli, in what is now modern-day Karnataka, Mudgal arrived in New York around 1920. In 1922, he was hired to work for the Daily Negro Times and its successor, The Negro World, both mouthpieces for the Pan-Africanist Marcus Garvey and his organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. By May 1930, Mudgal had risen in the ranks, serving as an acting manager editor for the magazine, a position he held until June 1932. Mudgal's writing often stressed the interconnected nature of the African-American struggle and worldwide anti-imperialist movements, including in India. The question of whose struggles the South Asian American community should identify with, one that we certainly face today, uh, was also evident seven years prior to Romola and Mudgal's correspondence in Bhaga Singh Thin's argument to the U.S. Supreme Court. In making his case, Thin had argued that he should be allowed to retain his American citizenship because as a, quote, high caste Hindu of full Indian blood, he had actually belonged to the Caucasian race. He was therefore white, Thin claimed, and thus should be eligible for citizenship. Thin was following in the lo logic of Takao Ozawa, a Japanese immigrant who just a few months earlier had argued before the Supreme Court that his skin was just as white as the average white person, and therefore he too should be allowed to become an American citizen. Like Thind, Ozawa also lost his case in an unanimous decision, because as Justice George Sutherland concluded, the term white person is confined to persons of the Caucasian race. And Ozawa, having been born in Japan, was clearly not Caucasian. So that is where Thind actually began his argument claiming that he was in fact Caucasian because of the purity, and this is his words, of his Aryan blood, which according to the outcome in the Ozawa decision should allow him to become an American citizen. In his argument, Thin was attempting to use caste segregation as a way to claim racial purity. At one point, Thin's petition describes how the quote, high class Hindu regards the aboriginal Indian mongoloid in the same manner as the American regards the Negro, speaking from a matrimonial standpoint. And his claim to be white, Aryan, Caucasian, high caste and high class, Thin was attempting to disassociate himself from categories that could be understood as non-white. Hence, he contrasts himself with the aboriginal, mongoloid, and negro categories, which are unmistakably not white. As the scholar Sucheta Mujumdar has argued, such a claim constitutes a racist response to racism. It was also a casteist response to racism. The Supreme Court justices again disagreed with Thin, this time because the word Caucasian was being used in a way differently from how it would be interpreted in accordance with the understanding of the common man. As Ozawa and Thind both learned, there was nothing that they could have said that to convince the Supreme Court otherwise, because it was not about scientific analysis or legal arguments. It was about the future of the country and what that future looked like. As Justice Sutherland further explained, the ch and this is a quote, the children of English, French, German, Italian, Scandinavian, and other European parentage quickly merge into the mass of our population and lose the distinctive hallmarks of their European origin. On the other hand, it cannot be doubted that the children born in this country of Hindu parents would re retain indefinitely the clear evidence of their ancestry. It is very far from our thought to suggest the slightest question of racial superiority or inferiority. What we suggest is merely racial difference, and it is, such it is of such character and extent that the great body of our people instinctively recognize it and reject the thought of assimilation. That's the end of the quote. A couple years later, John Muhammad Ali, a South Asian immigrant in Detroit, also found himself at the receiving end of the same rejection. Wallace Vischer, the US attorney in Detroit, became aware that Ali had naturalized as an American citizen in 1921 and began challenging his citizenship in court. Distancing himself from Thind, Ali argued that 
Even though he was a native of India, his ancestors were Arabians, and based on previous court rulings, where Indians, claimed to be, were, uh, where Indians claiming to be Afghani and Parsi were eligible for citizenship, he too should be accepted. His ancestors, Ali said, had, quote, been careful not to intermarry with the native stock of India, end quote, and even provided evidence in court linking his genealogy back 31 generations to the Prophet Muhammad himself. Ali lost as well, and his citizenship was canceled by the court. Embedded in both Thind and Ali's arguments was a claim to, quote, racial purity, and that seems deeply abhorrent today. But while critiquing the exclusionary sentiment of the time, Thind and Ali were simultaneously attempting to exploit existing prejudices that they thought would work in their favor. Thind, for example, was relying on the court's acceptance of him as a, quote, high caste Hindu, since the systemization of social hierarchy through caste was looked upon fondly in the United States at that time, with some wealthy men even going as far to call, them the Boston, call themselves the Boston Brahmins. As the Thin decision teaches us, the strategy of claiming whiteness or using one's religion, caste, gender, or wealth to appeal for acceptance is ultimately a losing one. In fact, it was only in the 1960s, as I mentioned, in the midst of the civil rights era led by Black Americans, that South Asians were finally allowed to, become, to enter the United States in larger numbers. And like H.G. Mudgal, South Asians worldwide have been drawing inspiration from and collaborating with Black Americans' fight for freedom and justice for centuries. In 1873, Jyoti Rao Phule, a social reformer in Maharashtra, India, began his essay, Gulamgiri, Slavery, with a dedication to American abolitionists. Then in 1971, a group called the Dalit Panthers in India declared in their manifesto, from the Black Panthers, Black power was established. We claim a close relationship with this struggle. And the final story that I want to share with you is actually from a new book um, that actually is coming out today by Isabel uh, Wilkerson. Uh, uh, there's a, a short piece about this book in The Guardian that Isabel Wilkerson wrote um, last week. And so I'll actually read a little bit from that piece for you, because I think it really also helps to complicate one of the stories that many South Asians think of as in when we think about solidarity between South Asians and African Americans. And that's the story of Martin Luther King Jr. and his being inspired by Mahatma Gandhi uh, in the civil rights movement here in the United States. So here's what Isabel Wilkerson says in The Guardian. And like I said, um, there's links to all of these stories from the um, sada.org slash UBC page. So please do go and read them in more detail when you get the chance. Um, here, these, these are Isabel Wilkerson's words. In the winter of 1959, after leading the Montgomery bus boycott that arose from the arrest of Rosa Parks and before the trials and triumphs to come, Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta landed in India at Palam Airport in New Delhi to visit the land of Mohandas K. Gandhi, the father of nonviolent protest. They were covered in garlands upon arrival, and King told reporters, to other countries I may go as a tourist, but to India I come as a pilgrim. He had long dreamed of going to India, and they stayed an entire month. King wanted to see for himself the place whose fight for freedom from British rule had inspired his fight for justice in America. He wanted to see the so-called, quote, untouchables, the lowest caste in the ancient Indian caste system, whom he had read about and had sympathy for, but who, he had still been, uh, but who had still been left behind after India gained its independence the decade before. He discovered that people in India had been following the trials of his own oppressed people in the US and knew of the bus boycott he had led. Wherever he went, the people on the streets of Bombay and Delhi crowded around him for an autograph. At one point in their trip, King and his wife journeyed to the southern tip of the country, to the city of Trivandrum in the state of Kerala, and visited with high school students whose families had been untouchables. The principal there made the introduction. Young people, he said, I would like to present to you a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. King was floored. He had not expected that term to be applied to him. He was, in fact, put off by it at first. He had flown in from another continent and had dined with the prime minister. He did not see the connection, did not see what the Indian caste system had to do directly with him, did not immediately see why the lowest caste people in India would view him, an American Negro, and a distinguished visitor as low caste like themselves, see him as one of them. For a moment, he later recalled, I was a bit shocked and peeved that I would be referred to as an untouchable. But then he began to think about the reality of the lives of the people he was fighting for. 20 million people consigned to the lowest rank in the US for centuries, still smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, quarantined in isolated ghettos, exiled in their own country. And he said to himself, quote, yes, I am an untouchable, and every Negro in the United States of America is an untouchable. In that moment, he realized that the land of the free had imposed a caste system not unlike the caste system of India, and that he had lived under that system all of his life. It was well laid beneath the forces he was fighting in the US. 
the work that we're, our community is doing today is part of a long trajectory, a long historical trajectory. But as it's clear, I think, from these stories, the work is not nearly done. And I would urge you, as I am attempting to do myself through the work with Sada, that we all join in the struggle for Black liberation and against anti-Black racism. I also um, want to end by noting that tomorrow is the anniversary of um, the Oak Creek Gurdwara massacre, massacre in 2012. On August 5th, 2012, a white supremacist walked into a Sikh temple, a Gurdwara in Wisconsin, and murdered worshipers um, who were there. And um, I think it's an important reminder in the midst of everything else that there are real attempts being made currently to erase not only our stories, but our very existence. And so the work that I hope that we can all do together is to ensure that our stories cannot be erased. So I'll end my comments there and turn it back over to Professor Schmenderman. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of those stories with us. Um, and I think the kind of historical richness of the narratives that you're um, able to bring out of the archive really helped to contextualize some of what's happening today um, in very powerful ways. So thank you for that. I'd like to turn it over um, to our next speaker, Dr. Sukhinder Carl Baines from University of the Fraser Valley, uh, who I hope can help connect some of what we've been hearing to um, the kind of uh, parallel trajectories here in Canada. Thank you. Oh, I think you're on mute, Sukhinder. Can you um, turn on your mic? Indeed, I am. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah, and for hosting today and for allowing us to come together. I want to acknowledge that uh, I live and work on the territory of the Stolo people, the Halkamelam speakers, and that I am working to understand my own complicity in the work that we do and working towards truth and reconciliation in British Columbia. I also want to thank uh, Samip for, you know, leading us in this charge about um, how Sa uh, Sarah has taken the history of the past and made sense of it for us today. And I want to start at the end where, uh, you know, it's a clarion call, I think, from Samip that says, you know, we have to be aware and, and note that erasure still is happening and that we are omitted all the time from history. And Sa Sarah's work is informing the work that we want to do in Canada around the South Asian Canadian digital archive and perhaps it's um, the, these omissions, these erasures and this lost history that uh, that Tamip has unearthed and archived, um, it, it kind of guides us as well as informs us uh, to ensure that our racial history becomes part of Canadian history and I'm really also um, in this last six months and previous you know 10 years that we've been talking about this is this, there's a lot, lot more acute awareness about anti-blackness and how it relates to uh, casteism in Canada uh, and in the South Asian context. Um, we have some great leaders in our midst, uh, not one of which passed away recently, Chinmoy Banerjee, and um, we have leaders who have led us to words uh, fighting all kinds of oppression, but I must say that um, those positions are, are weaker on the larger context of South Asian Canadian oppression fighting. And uh, we want to move towards what Samip has called as the interconnectedness uh, between us. And I think it's a very powerful word that can't be taken lightly, uh, where we are understanding our own complicitness, but at the same time starting to unearth our own anti-Blackness as South Asians, as well as casteism within our community. So the South Asian Korean Digital Archive's goal is to, you know, uh, hopefully, as Hamid has shown so clearly, is look at the history, the past history that's brought us to this point. So some of the same stories that Samip has shared around Gadar, around the Komagada Maru, around the legislative racism that was happening in Canada will all be um, hopefully uh, designed and presented in the South Asian Korean Digital Archive in a way that's accessible to the public and to the general you know, um, cultural historian or somebody who's interested, and especially I'm heartened by having Omayal as part of our group because we want to pass the torch on to the younger generation to carry this forward. And uh, we are hoping that the archive will have, as Hamid has done so well, is engage young people in the history because sometimes they're thinking that the war is won. And it is certainly Black Lives Matter has shown us, has shone a light on, on the fact that the war is not won and that 
uh, we have a lot of work to, to do. So I'm challenged by uh, these ideas of longing and belonging that, uh, that continue to haunt us as South, East, South Asian Canadians. This idea of, as you said, where are you from, where do you come from? This idea of we belong, but we, are, we don't belong. And so taking, I think for SACTA, uh, Samit has done is taking our history and taking charge of it, becoming the owners of our own history and telling it through our lenses telling it where uh, the importance of things that we need to portray out in, in Canadian history. And we are very much a victim of erasure and omission, uh, structural racism, white supremacy, uh, local and uh, national, provincial, um, you know, active racism to suppress uh, the history from coming to light. And uh, fortunately, with 115, 16 years of history in BC, uh, South Asian Canadians have reached that stage beyond survival. And I think this is a new phase. Uh, I would say in the last 10 years, I've seen a huge uh, surge of um, heritage, a huge understand, larger understanding of preservation of uh, collective ideas that need to be, uh, oral histories need to be collected so we can pass them on. So. I'm, I'm heartened by what you say, Samit, but I'm also disheartened in the sense that there is so much work to be done around our own work. And of course, we are also, because we are interconnected, uh, you know, we have Black Lives Matter, we have casteism, you know, Islamophobia, Hindu nationalism, we're fighting it on so many levels. And, and Ghadar at the time in 1913 was also fighting colonial uh, power in India from, you know, the Western provinces of, of America and Canada. So I think there's lots of information that we can uh, already, I feel we can unearth and share with, with each other. And I like Samit's idea where he does campaigns around certain uh, areas of history that engage the reader in ways that is not so academic perhaps, but is much more real and more um, applicable and apply applyable to their lives. Um, so I'm, I'm very much informed by um, Sarah's work in, the, in America, and I'm hoping that we can be complementary to each other and that our archive can as well cross-sect, intersect, as well as support and complement what happens in America. So that's really just my small bit of contribution to today. Uh, I would encourage anybody who's listening uh, to get in touch with us as well through Sarah or directly uh, to share those histories and take this opportunity uh, to present a, a South Asian Canadian history that speaks to everybody's story. Uh, there are some amazing stories that Sarah has shared with us and the very uh, first that have happened in Canada and the US are, are the lightning rods that we require to continue this work. Um, a larger number of people are in this work together now, which was you know in the, la in the previous uh, decades there was fewer people uh, at work, but now we have such an amazing array of uh, of friends and colleagues who are doing this work. So I'm really heartened by that. So I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of what South Asian Clean Digital Archive will be doing. We're just starting out, but we're certainly informed by Samip's work and uh, find it very 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 interesting as well as complementary to what we'll be doing. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, we now have time uh, for questions and discussion. Um, I hope that all of the attendees can see the Q&A button on the bottom right of your Zoom screen. If you want to click that, that will get, then open up a box into which you can type um, any question that you have. And I hope that both of our speakers, uh, you can kind of field the questions as a panel um, and, and both perhaps comment and also um, speak further with each other as, as suits you. Um, I do see that there's a question already in the chat box, um, which says uh, from um, Divya Chabra, which says, what was the reason why many Punjabis came initially I think some of you touched on that at the, the beginning of your talk, um, right, about the uh, migration, particularly to the Western um, areas of North America. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps we could start with a little bit more um, commentary on that. Yeah, that's a really good question. And so Flinder, please jump in as well with, with more. I mean, so from my perspective, I think there are, of course, push and pull factors to any migration. Um, just as a reminder for everyone uh, in the group that South Asia, of course, uh, but India uh, was British India until 1947. So we're talking about the colonial period. 
Um, and it was really beginning in the late 1800s and early 1900s, at least in, in the United States, that South Asians began coming, primarily those from the Punjab region. From what I've understood, it's the economic conditions that, that existed in Punjab, as well as um, the economic conditions in the United States that allowed for, for there to be an, to a larger number of Punjabi immigrants, um, and primarily Punjabi Sikh men to the United States. And like I said, they were working primarily as laborers. They're working on fa farms and fields, at least in the US, and it's in Canada as well, I know. Um, in lumber yards, mills. And what, one thing that I think is interesting to note is that during this early period of immigration, and I can once again only speak to the American context, that people would make this months long arduous journey um, to the United States. And um, they were arriving because they were coming to the West Coast, primarily through Angel Island, um, which is kind of the West Coast equivalent of Ellis Island, which many of us uh, are familiar with as the entry point for immigrants to the United States. The Angel Island, they would go through this really um, severe in interrogation process um, where they'd be asked about their monetary status, about their, you know, how much money they had, what, what kind of work that they had lined up for themselves, um, and all, also about their health. Um, and there's an article, in fact, that we have in, in Tides, once again, Sada's online magazine about this called Infecting Angel Island that talks about the various forms, various ways that, that immigration officials would uh, would find to exclude South Asians from entering the United States. So one was that there was this fear that South Asians who were entering the United States would become quote unquote public charges that if they entered the United States, that they would become reliant on the government or on the state for, for their welfare. The other was that there was a claim that South Asians were infected with hookworm, um, a disease that is, is a parasitic disease. And um, so I think what I read was that almost 50% of people who made this arduous journey on, by ship to Angel Island were being turned back to South Asia or where they originated from. Pathmundar, do you have anything more to add to that as well? Uh, for British Columbia, anyway, early 1900s, um, the, 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 the Punjabis had, you know, uh, through the millennia have been, in, that part of the country of India has been invaded by foreign invaders over millennia. So, invasion of people, of seeing different peoples, of having um, movements of people through that region is nothing new, was nothing new. And travel was another thing that uh, Punjabis anyway were always accustomed to. But I think in the late 1800s, 1900s is partly it's because of their privileged position in the colonies. Uh, they were seen as a martial race, so they had positions of uh, power within the, not power, I would say, but certainly positions of privilege in the army, in the colonial army, in the British army. And through that, they were inhabiting some of the colonies across Southeast Asia. So traveling for them was uh, not an unknown. But I think the one uh, um, pull factor and push factor, well, one of the more important ones was that they had disposable income that they were landowners. And I, I agree with you, Samit, that they came here and worked in the mills and the, and the forest industry, but their goals were not to keep working as um, laborers, but to actually own land and to own, and the very first uh, people that owned land was early 1900s. So I think they came with, from land owning backgrounds and they had disposable income. And because of the land tenure in India, where uh, their agricultural lands were being um, uh, becoming smaller and smaller uh, because of how the parents had to, um, you know, share their land between their sons. Going abroad was one of the options for one of the sons. You know, they always had an heir and a spare, so the spare had to leave and go and work somewhere else. And British Columbia certainly was uh, attractive to them once they heard that this was a raw, unsettled land and that the, it was being set up as a sister colony, uh, that uh, information traveled fast and wide through Hong Kong and through Japan and through Singapore and Malaya. So I think their travel was based on uh, just entrepreneurship as well. Um, uh, they came from service classes. They had worked for the uh, colonial government. So they actually also came with this idea that the British in, in British Columbia would uh, appreciate them coming here and that was actually far from the truth so when they got here the racial hierarchies were very very strong and the racism was legislative racism was very strong so I think they had some bumps in the road uh, for about 40 years of settling in British Columbia and but the initial stages were driven by their ideas of travel their ideas of economic welfare mostly a bachelor society mostly men who were coming here and since then British Columbia has a chain migration so in BC anyway people say we know each other everybody knows each other because the whole migration is based on chain migration from the early 1900s 
Uh, but you're right that there were lots of push and pull factors and economic uh, was one of them. And a number of them actually in the early years thought they were going back. They never came. They thought they weren't going to be permanent citizens. They were going to temporarily work here and go back. And the ones, the Gadarites that went back or went back to fight uh, pro-nationalists and wanted to fight to get the British out of India. So it's a very complex uh, history of Punjabis coming to BC in the early 1900s. Okay, I see several questions uh, there for you now. Are you able to read and respond on your own or would you like me to uh, pose those questions to you both? Uh, yeah, I think we can, we can try, to, try to respond. Um, Great, and um, yeah, I will, uh, I think I can make them visible to all attendees as you uh, bring them up. So if you would read out the questions that uh, before you answer, that would be great. Thank you. Well, it's definitely not to put on the spot, but this looks like the first question is actually for you from Rashmi Chaudhary. Um, so the question is how uh, does Black Lives Matter in the United States impact Canada and its racial justice movement in the current context? Yeah, um, I think uh, some of the conversations around working in silos has been problematic. Um, I have to say that South Asians in BC have a great amount of privilege and we haven't really unpacked that yet. I think we, if, if the spotlight is not on us, we kind of, don't go into the spotlight to see who is under the spotlight. Why are people being discriminated against? Not everyone, again, I'm not saying all of them. And partly it's been this, my theory has been that South Asians till, I would say till the early 2000s, late 1990s were, were in stages of survival. They, they were actually settling and adapting and integrating into Canadian society. It's our first, second generation of kids that we have who are born in Canada, who India is only an imaginary country to them. So I think that the shift has happened in the last, a seismic shift I believe has happened in the last 20 years where older generational, first generation or second, third generation South Asians who lived here were quite insular. And I think the shift now has been that we, have, we are becoming more aware. We've raised our heads. We're actually looking around the world and we're saying it's not just about us and how we can survive, but that we have to contribute in greater ways, understand our society in greater ways. I really believe that to be true for South Asians. They have been a bit in their own little world. So the question is, you know, how do we... Uh, get people out of that silo and raise aware and make them more aware. I mean, it's a, it's a very complex question. Uh, the older generation is very difficult to bring on board on these new ideas um, because they're so set in their ways and they feel that they've struggled for so long that we dare to question their integrity and their ability to, to survive the active overt racism that they faced. The work actually is more complex now because the racism is so covert. It's hidden. It's, we, have to, we have to find much more interesting ways of challenging it and finding ways to address it because covert racism, you can go to certain people and this is what happened to me. Overt racism is much more difficult. So I feel that the, the hope is in the younger generation that they will find many interesting ways to reach out. But I, I do also believe that some of the older generation are, are unreachable unfortunately. Even around caste, I mean, they're unreachable. They've set their ways and uh, religion informs a lot of their ideas uh, and society is formed on those religious ideas and it's very hard to break them down. This actually goes along with another question from Kamal Arora in the chat, um, which maybe I can just read out loud and, and then I'll try to answer it too. Much of the work done by the South Asian community on Black Lives Matter seems to be done in a silo, i.e. via social media for a particular audience, university educated white collar professionals, younger South Asians, or those involved in activism around caste and race already. What are some collective strategies we can use to take this work into broader community discourse? In other words, how can we get our aunties and uncles on board and cousins, siblings, et cetera? Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take an attempt to answer that. I mean, the first is that obviously I'm you know, very biased in, in this response, but that I think that stories, that human stories are really the most important way for us to be able to break down those boundaries because um, they demonstrate, I think, the history, I mean, they really make clear the histor historical lineages and the ways that the histories from 100 years ago are, are being repeated and the ways that we fit into those histories, right? Like, so hearing H.D. Mudgal's story and the stark correspondence between Mudgal and Romala, for example, it, it really makes it very clear the, the kinds of conversations that are happening in our community today. And I think they also 
are an opening point for discussion, for dialogue, and for change. I really believe that. The other thing that I'll say is that um, I think, you know, one thing that the murder of George Floyd earlier this summer and the protests and Black Lives Matter movement following that demonstrated is that people can change their minds relatively quickly, right? Because I think what has been shown is that that, that, that killing galvanized so much public opinion. Um, and that I think we have to believe that there is the possibility for our community to change and to really accept, um, accept change um, going forward. I think we have to continue to believe that even if it seems very frustrating in the moment or seems impossible in the moment. But related to that, I would say that I, I think that the goal doesn't need to be to convince everyone. The goal needs to be towards Black liberation and indigenous sovereignty and towards South Asian liberation as well, I would say. And what that means is that we don't have to convince every single South Asian American that they need to see solidarity with Black communities for that solidarity to exist, for it to happen, right? So I think we shouldn't necessarily see that as the end goal, that we should be moving our community in the right direction and be engaging and activating as much of our community as possible. But we shouldn't be hung up on the fact that, you know, an uncle or an auntie or a cousin or a friend, whoever hasn't, hasn't agreed with that. Um, that opinion may be difficult to change, but we can move greater public opinion more quickly, I think. So I, also think Sa I also think, Sam, um, we need to really look at our language. Like, mm -hmm. I think we can affect change through our language. Our language is very coded. Our relationships are very coded and we need to uncode those a little bit. Um, I, I think we are at the vanguard of being warriors uh, in our own communities where we are fighting the good fight to undo the damage that has been done by age old traditions of casteism uh, and colorism within our communities. So I do think, uh, Kamal, I think that our aunties and uncles around language, I, I'm constantly working on unpacking my own language in, when I use it and finding ways to ensure that it's inclusive, that it's not discriminatory, that uh, how I code people's uh, casts are not based on what the uh, tr old people had said was true. So. I do believe there is hope that uh, we can work with, with, within our community. Discourse is around language. I really believe that we have to change our language and how we talk, what we say and how we say it. And if you have the influence like you do, and we do around the people who are in this, in this chat, like whoever you can influence, younger, older, you know, middle-aged, whatever it is, I think we have to find that influence. So I think influence is a great, you don't have to be a YouTuber and you know, those people on these social media chats, but you can influence so many people within your um, groupings. And I'm heartened to say that over time, the corpus of your um, language and how you use it and how you inform people starts to shift. I really believe that. So one question from an anonymous attendee is, would you be willing to recommend some readings, resources for learning more about the lineages that you discussed? And so I'll, I'll recommend a few, and then maybe Sukhwinder, if you had a few that you would think would be yeah. useful for people to start. Um, so one, one I'll mention, of course, is Colored Cosmopolitanism, Nico Slate's book, which uh, is linked from that SADA page that I created for this event, but also you can certainly look up. The other is The Karma of Brown Folk by Vijay Prashad, which I think you know, was written, I don't know, 20 years ago now, maybe even more, but really I think so concisely captures the kinds of struggles that our community is facing today. Um, and I think that's a really incredible book. The other is that I'll share is um, a, resources created, a resource created by Anirvan Chatterjee called A Secret History of South Asian and African American Solidarity. Um, it's just a website, but um, it's a really powerful website that includes some of the stories that I shared and many, many more, including many, many references for how to learn more about these stories. So I'm gonna add a link to that site in the, um, oh no, that didn't go to everyone. I'll try to add a link to the site if I can figure out how to do it um, for everyone so that you can um, click and learn more. And so from there, do you have any recommendations? I don't have recommendations right now. I think what we can do, I don't know if uh, there's ability, Sarah, is to put a list together and send it out. Uh, maybe Omayal, we can uh, put a list together and send it out. Yes, we're reading so much right now, I'm, I'm drawing a blank in terms of what, I should recommend. I'm really cautious in terms of what I recommend as well, so that people feel that they're getting a good balanced view. Um, of 
course, a, a plethora of reading around anti-blackness that's um, you know everywhere around us. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a list right now. I think that's a great idea. If you want to share resources, then perhaps we can compile them and share a follow-up email with um, registered attendees. Thanks. That sounds Let's great. That. Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, Go ahead. Another attendee said, I agree with Dr. Baines. Oops, sorry. Uh, the second gener third generation is in a place of privilege that the generations before did not have. They were doing the immigrant struggle. But now how do we educate this generation and then move them forward and activate them? So which generation? I can't see the question. Can you say it again, Samir? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, it says um, the second and third generation is in a place of privilege that the generations before did not have. They were doing the immigrant struggle. But now how do we educate this generation and then move them forward and activate them? I think this is going on the comment that you were making um, a yeah. few minutes ago. Just my own, my own uh, university students that I see, you know, they're, they're living in these multiple worlds right now. And some of them feel I'm dragging them back to where their parents struggled and they just don't want to go there. You know, a number of them have kind of resist the idea that they have to go and understand their parents' immigrant experiences and that somehow they have to carry that forward. And they felt that the struggle, uh, like I said, the war has been won. But I think the second and third generation, as you said, Samab, so clearly, if we don't know our history, we, we live in a vacuum and we don't have a foundation to jump off of. So the larger number of students that I talk to, I feel, have this great aha moment uh, where they finally have this click. Like there's a click, there's a puzzle, there's a drop, there's a mic drop, there's a like, oh, I got it, I get it now. And it's partly because in British Columbia, we don't teach South Asian Korean history in the schools. And we don't have young people knowing their own history. So the little bit that they gain maybe from an activist auntie or an uncle or someone that they've talked to, their parents may have not had the time to read their own histories and understand them or have not had time to orally pass it down. So I think the work that Sara and Sakta and others are doing around oral history preservation, I think is is where the second and third generation can perhaps spend some time. And I know the courses that we teach, like Sarah mentioned earlier, I think that's where uh, this work is so critical. The, we may not appreciate it right now. I have a number of people we go and interview that say, oh, what's my story? I've really got nothing to tell until they start telling it. And the collective, the aggregate of those stories is what informs the future. So I, don't, I, I feel that if we don't do the work today, then the tomorrow won't happen. Um, so I think the second and third generation, we have to do the work for them in a sense. And I'm taking some of the kicking and dragging into this, uh, into this world, but a number of them are quite open to hearing it. Now, having said that, I want to say that they are stressed out around their own complex lives. And, and at, some po at some level, they want to just be Canadian, whatever that is. I don't know what that is yet, but that's what it is. They, they, they want to start to forget that there was this history, this black history and dark history. And it's, it's, it's a tough time, but I think, I think this work that we're doing is really about fighting the war. I really believe of ignorance, of omission, of erasure, of omission, of uh, designed in exclusion. Uh, if when you say it like that, when you layer it, when you put the layer, one layer on top of another, on top of another, then people get it. But that's long time work. That's long term work. We want young people to go into graduate studies, to do PhDs in this work, so that then there's a continuation of the work. So it doesn't end here. We want people in positions that are training PhD students to give them that encouragement to do this work. There's another question from Manju Reddy that says, uh, my question, given that we're in the midst of so many challenges, interested to know how uh, thoughts from the panel and how casts that we brought with our immigration play out in that light, in light of the IBM case and also in Isabel Wilkers Wilkerson's writing um, from Manju Reddy. So to respond to that, I would say that it's only because of the work of Dalit activists that we are even beginning to include caste in our analysis of South Asian, South Asian American immigration in the South Asian American community. And I really think that we need to look to their work to understand how caste plays out. So I'd recommend a few um, organizations and individuals 
to, to look out for to read uh, more about. The first is, of course, the quality labs. And once again, I want to make a plug for the event on August 18th, because I think they'll be addressing this question um, in much more detail than I'd be able to provide right now. And um, they do incredible work. In addition to the presentation on August 18th, please check out their website. And on the website, look for the CAST in the United States report. It's a report from 2018, but one that really, I think, illuminates the impact that CAST has on the South Asian diaspora and that that is coming out now in so many ways in public. The other um, person that I'd recommend um, following is Suraj Yengbe, a Dalit scholar um, who writes incredibly about CAST and has a new book out as well. Um, and you can, if you, I, it came out of his website, but if you Google his name, his website will come out and he has a, a, a weekly or bi-weekly newsletter. Um, email newsletter where he shares his thoughts on caste in the United States. And the third um, that I'll recommend is, even though I haven't read it yet because it comes out today, is Isabel Wilkerson's writing because what I've read in the New York Times and The Guardian, I think it really is going to connect caste and anti-blackness and race in ways that are really, really powerful and really, really important for this moment. The, the last thing that I'll mention is that, um, and I'm going to give a plug for this in a moment, so I won't give the plug yet, but um, that we have a fellowship program, the Archival Creators Fellowship Program, where we um, are working with members of marginalized groups that have been marginalized within the South Asian American experience to tell their own stories. And one of our fellows this year, Tanya Adanki, is, is conducting oral history interviews and telling valid stories in the United States. And so if you co go to the Osada website and you look for Tanya's work there, I think you'll get first person accounts for how caste and, um, and, and its relationship to immigration um, play out in the American context. So please check out the work that she's been doing, really incredible, thoughtful work that she's been doing. Kutwinder, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Um, I think we in British Columbia, I think we have some really great organizations that continue to do good work. But I think where the, only recently have I noticed that there is going to be some uh, complementary work by other organizations to support each other. I think they, we unfortunately work in a lot of uh, our own little silos and uh, Sunset being one, uh, Jai Birdi's group. Uh, we have uh, Poetic Justice is a new foundation that started up in BC. So the quality labs, as you mentioned, I think the work, we ha have to get our antennas out a bit. We need to do some more digging. We need to be more aware of what's going on around here. And I think it is part of it is just our privilege in knowing that, you know, we've, we've made it. And so whatever's back there, we don't need to worry about. So much more awareness on that. Um, sorry, I'm still looking through. Uh, so one, someone asked about repeating the name of the book that started Karma Up. So it's a, called The Karma of Brown Folk by Vijay Prashad. And Sarah, are there any particular questions? There's a lot, so I'm trying to just scroll through and, and pick them out randomly. Um, yes, thank so you, I've by the way. Thank you all for these excellent questions. This is so fun to have this conversation. I wish we could all have this conversation together because it really is um, a conversation that I think we should all be having. This is so much, uh, you know, our, our community voices need to be heard in this conversation. And so the other thing I'll say is that if there are opportunities to have these collective conversations, please take them up. Um, right. They really are so powerful and so important at this moment. I, w I would really recommend that uh, South Asian organizations and uh, Canadian organizations in Canada start to really organize around indigenous lives as well, not and black lives, because in BC, we, we have a, a a history, a very, very, you know, long and dark history of discrimination against indigenous lives. And I think we play lip service a little bit too. And we got to stop being bystanders in this. We have to really engage ourselves. So I, I'd like to see a bit more work done on that uh, from our organizations. That would be very useful. You know, somebody asked the question about the Ram Mandir celebration in Times Square. And when I heard about it, you know, my antennas went up and I got a bit of a, you know, pushback in my own uh, personal view, but I do believe that there is a larger play at play here nationally uh, from, from India that continues. And we do need to be more um, vigilant about what's going on in our province as well in our country. So talking to, you know, making sure our government understands our positions as diasporic people living in British Columbia is really important. Uh, and for uh, think tanks and uh, people who publish in the papers, all that. Um, we have some great writers in BC that are writing in our local papers and it's wonderful to see their um, articles come out. I was just gonna mention, um, there's a question that speaks to some of what you were just saying, Kathinder, which says, what does colored cosmopolitanism look like in a settler colony? 
with South Asian and other migrants also being migrant settlers to some extent. And I think that's really important for all of us to consider. Um, so is, is there more you might like to say about that, Ethiopia? Samet, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, we need to recognize our own position, right? That, you know, we see ourselves as an immigrant community, a community that has been, um, that has been um, in many ways faced xenophobia and racism, but we are also a community that has come to take advantage of what has been created in the United States. Um, that was created through um, suppression of indigenous communities that was created through black slavery. And so I think we have to recognize our own role in that. Um, I don't know if I have anything more to add to that, but other than to say that we must be, be you know, we have to recognize our role and not assume that because we are also in many ways facing discrimination, um, facing racism, facing xenophobia, that we can automatically understand the struggles of other communities of color. Like we should also humble ourselves to know that we, um, that we have our own position in these histories, but that we are also in many ways taking advantage of what was being created by others. There's also a, oh, sorry, did you want to speak again? There's a question in the chat, um, which takes us into a slightly different domain about the nature of archives, uh, which I think is really worth discussing. Um, it says academia can be a privileged space that promotes elitism and classism. I'm wondering what oral history preservation might look like outside of academic spaces that are often heavy in academic language and not accessible for everyone. Most of this archival work is in the arts, but I'd love to see that expand in an accessible way that includes international communities, including refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so any reflections on that? Well, last year at the museum in Abbotsford, uh, there was an interesting conversation, which was just about uh, bringing uh, people from all communities and walks of life to share their stories and to have tea with each other everybody has a tea tradition um so they're trying people are trying to open their doors to more live conversations to more uh human interaction rather than the academic record which is on on online the work we did over the last uh, four or five years uh, we have about 300 interviews all those interviews are done in 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 the narrative just as they speak like we have not gone on gone and embellished them we have not done our own version of what they said uh, obviously when we you know publish etc we'll we'll analyze them but the stories themselves are raw they are just simple stories of people's lives um unfortunately our life we're so busy we're not even doing that in our own homes so uh, chin Banerjee's interview was just done you know last year we're just lucky that we got that done um so I do believe the storytelling is such an age old tradition uh, that if we become involved in, in the new world and forget that, I think we will do us a disservice. Uh, but I do agree with you. I mean, Sara is a great example of how it's accessible to anyone. It's a very, much, very interesting site. Uh, anyone who wants to read about it should be able to go in and pick it up. Uh, and I'm hoping Sakta will do the same, but uh, I do understand that you know, it does happen. Yeah, I mean, to add to your response, um, so from there I would say that, you know, like you said, SADA is an organization that exists outside of academia and we're an independent organization. And I think for us, I have been very um, proud of that independence. If it was something that was very purposeful from the very beginning of the organization history. Um, and one of the questions that we often receive is like, why is SADA not part of a university or a larger institution? For us as an organization, I think the response is that our history should belong to our community and our organization that advocates for our history should belong to our community. And so, you know, the core of our work, all of our work, our mission uh, is really dedicated to collecting and sharing South Asian American histories. Without that mission, we don't exist. And so um, it holds us accountable, I think, in many ways to our community because that is the work that we do. So much of our support and so many of you on this, on this meeting are SADA supporters, so I thank you for that. But so much of our support as an organization comes from our, our community. And, with that, that support, once again, the organization wouldn't exist. The, the more overarching thought is as well that we don't need anyone to legitimize our story or our histories, that it is us that tells what our, us that tells people what our story is. And so I think that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. And I'm very dedicated, not just to helping to build um, SADA, but also to helping other communities that have been overlooked and excluded from historical narratives to be able to share their own stories. I'm very proud of the work that SADA has been doing in collaboration with other community-based archives. So we're part of um, an, a consortium of community-based archives called the Community Archives Collaborative. 
um, with, at this point, three other community-based archives, the Texas After Violence Project, Densha, which is a Japanese-American archive, and Interference Archive, which is a political archive based in New York City. And we're thinking about how community-based archives like ours can support each mm -hmm. other, can learn from each other, can collectively um, you know, be more sustainable and, um, and have a more uh, longer lasting and deeper impact to the work that we do. And so I think that, yes, it's, you know, what you said can be true um, for the person who asked this question, but I think that there are many of us who are dedicated and committed to our community stories um, belonging to and being part of our community's existence, um, and we're going to continue doing that work. The last question I'd love to answer is from someone who asks, as a writer and researcher, I would like to contribute in any way to complement your work. How can I help? Sorry, this is, I thought, a great question. <laughs> and maybe, Seth, I can let you go first. Um, and then as well. I don't know where you are or who you are, but you know, contact us. Uh, we're so, so <laughs> willing and able to help you as help us get to these stories. And if you have something that you can share or something you want to explore or uncover, because everyone has a new different perspective and they want to tell the story in their way. You know, there's, there's no limitations. I think, uh, please contact us. We're online. You know, you can find us. Sarah can share information if she so pleases, but we are, very much, a, a, as, as Samit mentions, a community of people that is really engaged. I saw, you know, uh, people who were attending, some of my friends and colleagues who attend from other universities in British Columbia. I think universities have a really important role in terms of how we spend our time uh, doing long-term research and really creating a corpus of work that takes us into the, into the future, although uh, individuals as well, uh, corporate corporations as well, do some work, good work. I think universities have a big role to play, and I think they are doing some amazing work, the ones we're engaged with. I want to give them a shout out to all the ones who are attending today, that, you know, your work informs all of us, and we take courage from continuing this work, and again, Umayal, it's really up to you guys, you know, to take it on and do more after this. Uh, it, it doesn't stop here. I think this is very much the beginning. I'll mention two ways to get involved with SADA. One is uh, through our volunteer group, which meets once a month and um, in includes a really wonderful group of dedicated SADA volunteers who each month we kind of do different projects that help support the work of the archive. So if you're interested in getting involved there, it's a relatively min minimal commitment. It's a monthly meeting and maybe two or three hours of work per month. Um, but you can learn more at sada.org slash volunteer. And the other opportunity that I mentioned in relationship to Tania Dunphy's um, project this year is this fellowship program that we have, which I'm happy to share has been funded for two more years. So um, it's a program that was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And as I mentioned, allows us to work with those from groups um, that have been marginalized within the South Asian American community to share their own stories and their own words through oral histories, through collecting archival materials, et cetera. Um, and so the call for applications is now live. So if you go to sada.org slash fellowship, you can apply for the fellowship. We'll be able to select six fellows this year and six next year. It's a paid fellowship, includes a lot of support, both financial support, but also support Amazing. from the organization um, and being able to share your community story. So please do apply. The application deadline is August 24th. So we're coming up in about three weeks. That's wonderful, Simon. Well, that seems like a really positive note to end on. Um, I, <clears throat> I think you've uh, been able to discuss the content of most of the questions, even if uh, the, the main ideas, even if not all of the specific details there. I think there are other participants who were interested in talking more about the relationships between racism and casteism, right? Um, and also some of the challenges of um, uh, basically a religious identity as something relatively new. There's an interesting question about that. Uh, about the rise of Muslim Hindu tensions and the, a, a kind of observation that in the early stories that Samip shared, uh, as I think you mentioned, Hindu was used as a racial category. Uh, and there was this sense in which all South Asians were, uh, in a sense, uh, unified in their, uh, in the way in which they were represented, at least by outsiders, perhaps not internally, right? And so thinking uh, it would be interesting to reflect a bit more upon those issues if you have any uh, con concluding thoughts to add. Um, the question is really about, um, you know, is this relatively recent that Muslim Hindu uh, tensions arose and do we see that in the historical record at all? In BC, you see a lot of solidarity 
you know, the early years till, till the 70s, until the 80s, I would say, we saw a lot of solidarity. After the 80s, there was some disruption and interruption to that, uh, partly based on politics, geopolitics of the nation. But until, you know, India was divided in 47, until then they lived as brethren. I, I felt here in BC anyway, the fight for the vote, the Gadar, the Komagata Maru, the anti-racist legislation, the my immigration rules, uh, nationalist movement, it was secular. And it's, I would, you know, I would hate to say that we have Hindu, Muslim, Sikh rivalries or, or issues in BC, you know, they flare up here and there, but I don't see, I see people working quite well with each other. Great. Yeah. That, that, you know, as Sathinder said, the early histories of South Asian migration, and, and perhaps because the community was so small in the United States that there was a lot of solidarity and collaboration between, um, I guess, you, as you would think, different religious groups within the U.S., and the Gother Party is a really good example of that. If anyone's interested in learning more, I would recommend Seema Sohi's book, The Echoes of Mutiny, which um, talks about the Gother Party and its history in, in some detail, and, we've, and she's also written about that history in Tides, um, which is out of online magazine. That's great. I think it's just really valuable to bring up the bring those histories to the fore as well, right? And to to contextualize that way in which the divisions that we're familiar with today were not always necessarily the operative ones. And I think that really gives us some um, interesting models to think about how to move forward as well. So. Um, on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to both of you for sharing your time and your expertise and your knowledge with us and to all of the participants for being with us here virtually. Thank you also um, for all of the questions. It seems like there's really a strong interest in some follow up. So we'll talk uh, amongst ourselves about how we can uh, share that information back out um, and hopefully be able to send a follow up note with some of the resources that were mentioned here today. Um, so once again, thank you, and uh, please do join again on August 18th for the next um, the next event along these lines. Thank you so thank much. You, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.